Welcome to the fifth of our videos on tension elements, which is focusing on the support structure for potential tensile elements. Tension structures can be very deceiving because they look unbelievably delicate and lightweight, but they also tend to have fittings and materials that are quite expensive. And on top of that, they often have huge amounts of structural material that are disguised, that's disguised or hidden underground. And so that's the topic we really want to address in this particular video, is how do we create these huge horizontal forces that are necessary to make tension elements work as suspension elements. So here we have a, a series of images that show different ways that we might generate the components that are necessary to make the tensile structure work. Uh, first of all, in every case here, you notice we have a suspension element, um, but we just have different ways of supporting it. In every case, we also have two vertical elements that are providing the uh, vertical component that's necessary to resist whatever the gravity load is. Um, in no instance, though, can we have just two vertical columns and not have some other element that can produce a horizontal force. So, for example, here, the top of this tower compression element is stabilized by a straight stay, and this straight stay creates a horizontal component that's able to resist the horizontal component associated with the suspension element that's spanning between the two supports. This straight stay has a huge amount of tension in it, and in this case, it's been anchored into the ground with what we call an anchorage, this big chunk of basically concrete. Um, and this cable has to engage that entire concrete, and by the way, it wouldn't be done in this way where the cable is splayed outward like this. Um, that's not what this is intended to represent. These elements are some other kind of uh, tensile elements in the form of mild steel. And we'll, we've mentioned, of course, some of the ways in which that kind of anchorage can be achieved. The key point that we want to go over here is this block of material may be a gigantic block in order to resist both the horizontal and the vertical component associated with the stay. This horizontal force is resisted uh, also by the pressure of this soil against this footing. If this face is not big enough and the soil is not strong enough, this anchorage can skid along a surface and plow dirt in front of it. So there are a lot of complex issues having to do with how we design this anchorage. If the soils are really poor and the forces are really high, we may not want to resist this force with the gravity of this gigantic chunk of concrete. And we might actually find out that we'd rather run a grade beam underground, in which case, of course, the stay as it pulls up induces bending in this element, and this grade beam has to be a very effective member. We can also provide the horizontal force by putting a compression strut across the top here. So the inward pull of these cables or the suspension element on the tops of these uh, columns is resisted by an outward force in this compression strut. In this case, the compression strut has been rendered as a truss in order to give it uh, extra breadth against buckling, but also to keep it from collapsing downward under its own self-weight. Um, here we have one other kind of structure, which uh, we have the two verticals. We have the material balanced on each side of those verticals, and the inward pull of this tension member is resisted by a compression strut across the bottom here. So this element works in compression. Uh, in the last case we've got here, the inward force of these cables is resisted by these cantilever elements that are basically coming up um, out of the ground and they connect to a grade beam. I sometimes refer to this as a C-clamp structure because the shape is sort of like a C-clamp. Uh, 
it starts off thin, it gets thicker, remains thick along the back side, and then tapers again here. Um, not shown in the previous diagram, but one of the most common configurations uh, for the great suspension bridges is the following. Uh, in this case, we don't have a straight stay here, but we actually have road bed that's supported there and there and there. So it's manifest as curvature along here and, and here. <laughs> that's not too good. And there. Um, in the previous diagram, we showed this case where there's no load along here, so it's a straight stay but now we have curvature here and the only significant force that this particular anchorage is applying at this point is a horizontal force because the member is coming in horizontal at that point and we can break that up into a series of what we call free body diagrams so here we have the cable uh, in combination with the anchorages and you see that we have all the forces that are associated with um, these with with the loads, the gravity loads. Here we have an upward reaction due to the column and by action-reaction pairs that means the tension member is pulling, pushing down on the column and then the column has some support underneath due to the pressure of the soil on the footing down below. But you'll notice there's a lateral force here that's required to keep this anchorage from skidding uh, under the influence of this tension member and that lateral force is produced by the soil and by action reaction pairs that means the anchorage is pushing back against the soil and if this pressure is too high for that soil to re resist then the anchorage will skid inward and the structure will collapse down so we can take uh, basically half of the structure so, uh, let me get this pointer working again. We can come out to the middle and we can say, let's look at that portion right there. And often, unless there are special conditions, like in the case of the Golden Gate Bridge, you'll notice it doesn't quite fit this model because the supports needed to be put uh, more towards the ends because of the deep chasm that existed there that they didn't want to go too far out into that chasm. Um, but in this case, you'll notice that everything appears to be balanced. In other words, this is one quarter span, that's one quarter span, that's one quarter span, and this is one quarter span. And uh, so we have two quarter spans balanced on each side of the support. So when we come here and we draw this, we see this is what it looks like, where this portion is balanced by that portion, and we have a horizontal force at each end because it comes basically, the tangent of the tension member, the suspension member, is horizontal at those points. Um, now, um, those horizontal forces have to be generated in, uh, in some manner and uh, this is the Golden Gate Bridge and by the way I mentioned that uh, this portion is more than that so the shape of this is not exactly balanced and we don't come in exactly tangential at this point but the basic issue here is the following we need a huge anchor and I'm drawing this about correct now that's what the concrete chunk looks like to resist the force in that cable. Notice how delicate the cable is and here we have uh, something on the order of a hundred thousand tons of concrete that's buried in a rock mountain that adds additional mass to it and that's what you have to have to resist something like this steel cable. The steel cable is capable of exerting uh, at yield 250,000 pounds per square inch, but under normal loading conditions, 170,000 pounds per square inch, and the diameter of this uh, bundle of strands is basically 37 inches in diameter. So this cable is able to exert enormous forces, and those forces are getting resisted by this huge chunk of concrete here. 
This is showing uh, that anchorage being put in place, huge amounts of concrete that are buried already underground, and then the concrete is going to get built up. They're currently placing these pieces of mild steel that are going to be buried in the concrete. So the, uh, the final chunk is enormous. And on the other side, by the way, on the San Francisco side, this is the hole in the ground that got dug. And just for reference, that's a person right there. So this entire hole is going to get filled with concrete and steel as a way of providing that anchorage. So it's a little deceptive that this super delicate, super efficient structure ends up having to have this kind of anchorage in order to keep it to make it function. Now, this is the Bay Bridge. The Bay Bridge is like two bridges back to back, because you'll notice there are four of these towers instead of two. And in the case of the Bay Bridge, it does turn out that it's uh, symmetric about each tower. The challenge when you put two of these back to back is that if you have a huge amount of load, like all the traffic comes to a stop right there, that tends to pull this cable and this cable really hard, which starts to pull the towers over. And the towers could be pulled over really easily if you have a whole series of cables here that cumulatively are able to stretch quite a bit. Um, and so if you don't have an anchorage every once in a while, you have this problem that the towers tend to become unstable. And the way that was dealt with in the Bay Bridge is with this weird chunk of material right here that basically uh, at, at the connection point between the two bridges, it's what takes up into account any asymm asymmetry in the loads on the two bridges. So this is a little more dramatic shot of it. So here we have one bridge and then we have the other sort of standard configuration for a bridge. And this huge chunk, look how delicate these cables are. Let me go to the next image. You can barely see those cables. And then this gigantic chunk of concrete and stone is what's necessary to help keep these towers stable because that steel cable, if you have a really heavy load in, in say this bay right here, it could pull all these towers on this side over under that influence. So um, this anchorage is another huge investment that's necessary to make these cables work. And by the way, this is a chunk of, of stone mountain called Yerba Buena Island. And then there's also stone over uh, on the, on the um, San Francisco side. So that's what allows these anchorages to work. Okay, so if we come back to this image, um, we had this scheme right here where we said this element works in compression and this element works in tension. Now that's distinguished from here where this road bed is not working in compression to carry these loads. There are big old chunks of concrete over here and over on the other side and they're providing the horizontal component. But when we look at this building, there is no anchorage at the end here to make it work. So in order for it to work, this compression element or this roof element has to work in compression. <clears throat> this is a famous uh, paper factory by uh, Pierre Luigi Nervi. And he basically um, used that technique where this roof, which would normally be just sort of for bending purposes between these vertical suspenders, and it might also be to prevent uh, deformation under asymmetric or non-uniform loads. It now has taken on the additional function of working in compression to help resist the horizontal forces associated with these cables. And you'll notice here there are four uh, planes of these tension members along here and everywhere they occur there's a beefing up of the structure that is necessary to handle the compression forces in order to make that work. The last example we had was
where these elements that are projecting up become basically cantilevered beams out of the ground. The simplest way to do this, of course, would be to have a grade beam buried in the ground and then a good moment connection around the corner here so that this thing is sturdy enough to resist the horizontal forces that are being exerted on it by the cable. Um, we have an example of this that's not exactly the same as that, but uh, we could do without that beam by having a compression element here that holds them apart and a tension element here that uh, holds them together. And we actually have a structure like that uh, in the Dulles Airport. And in the Dulles Airport, um, it's much more expressive than this sort of crude image that I've drawn where the uh, columns have been uh, tapered and are leaning outward and uh, they sort of express this whole lo notion that against the inward pull of this roof the the columns which are which are actually cantilevered beams coming out of the ground um, have been tilted outward to sort of express that redirection of force and some people actually think the weight of these columns is resisting the tensile force in, from the roof, but that's absolutely not true. It has a beautiful expression to it, but um, this force still dominates, and if there's not some super anchorage down in this base here, these columns will tilt over and get pulled inward. Um, and to sort of express that idea, this is some of the columns, or those, um, they're both cantilevered beams, but they're also columns in that they have some axial force in them under the effect of gravity. Um, but the roof structure comes off and pulls inward like this. And you'll notice this has got a lot of tension on that side. And then there's a lot of tension here. And that's reflected in that there's a huge density of steel on the outside here and a huge density of steel on the upper side here. And what we're actually looking at right now is this is with some partial formwork around, but this is just the steel reinforcing that's going into the concrete, which is very expressive of how the structure is behaving. So to make that point even more emphatic, look how dense the steel is here. You can't even see any light coming through it. And the same is true up there, which is very expressive of how this thing is use working. So if this doesn't get anchored down right here, uh, this will not work. This is not a pure column. It's a member in bending. It's got compression on one side and tension on the other. So that ends our discussion of support structures for tensile elements. And again, I want to emphasize they have to be very carefully thought through. And when you look at a tensile structure and you think that is so elegant and so simple, you should rethink that entire concept because often to make the tension part of the structure work, the support structure that goes with it may have to have huge anchorages or may have to have tremendous bending elements which have huge amounts of tension and compression in various parts of them.